Hello, everyone, and good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on where you happen to be joining from, uh, where, wherever you happen, happen to be joining us from, from today. Um, and welcome to the David Newfeld Memorial Lecture. My name is Glenn Easton, and I'm a contract instructor at the University of New Brunswick St. John and one of the co-conveners of the David Newfeld Memorial Lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you for, joining you from Minoskwe, which you might know as, as St. John, New Brunswick. Minoskwe is located within the traditional and unceded territory of the Wulistikwe. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which, which the, 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 the Wulistikwe, the Mi'kmaq, and the Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The, 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 the treaties did not deal with the surrender of, uh, of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Wulistikwe, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy title and established the rules for, for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. I would similarly invite those of you who are joining us to reflect on, on your responsibilities to the traditional territories from which you're joining us today. David Neufeld was a historian who championed many things, including Northern history, environmental history, public history, and Indigenous history and heritage. He spent his career as a Parks, Parks Canada historian, lear, the, 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 historian the, 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 and learning from the people and, and, and the land of the Yukon Territory, pushing for inclusion and two-eyed seeing, and mentoring young and early career researchers who shared, who shared his passion. Many graduate students, um, including myself and the other co-conveners of, uh, of this lecture, would fondly remember his generosity as a scholar as he invited us into his home, offering us a cup of coffee or tea. Here we, we would casually discuss history. David always had a way of subtly introducing us to, 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 to various new ways of looking at the Yukon's history. The, the passing of, Dave, of David in late, late 2020 had, had, brought, had brought light to, 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 to just how many people, people both within and outside the academic world, David, David has influenced, supported, and mentored throughout his life. In, in order to honor, honor David's legacy, the David Newfeld Memorial Lecture will take place annually in a virtual format and will feature feature the work of early career researchers, public historians, and Indigenous historians and heritage workers. In keeping, keeping with his spirit, this event will remain free and, and open to the public and house for future viewing. Today, we're excited to present to, 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 to you a, a moderated discussion about the, about the Trondic Klondike UNESCO World Heritage Site. We, 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 we are honored to be joined by Ali Witten, Winton, sorry, Rebecca Kennedy and Barb Hogan, who were each involved in the pr process of drafting, submitting, and successfully securing its designation. Alexandra or, 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 or Ali Winton um, ha had the privilege of growing up in Toronto Collection lands and is grateful, grateful to, to, to be raising her own children there. She holds a master's in historical geography with a focus on oral, uh, 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 focus on, uh, uh, on oral history research. Ali's real and continu continuing education has, has been courtesy of the Toronto Quechan Heritage Department, where she has wor worked in various capacities since 2007. Currently, she works as a, as a steward for the Toronto Quechan Oral History Collection. For, meanwhile, we have Rebecca Kennedy as well, um, who, 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 who's a manager, manager of international affairs at Parks Canada. She is based in Ottawa. Um, she, she has, she, she has worked, worked in, the, in the World Heritage Field for 15 years, including providing support to many communities and on, 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 on World Heritage, Heritage nominations across Canada. And finally, we have Barb Hogan, who, 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 who lived and worked in Dawson City for 20 years and, and with much of, much of her work occur, occurring in the heritage sector. Moving to Whitehorse in 2002, Barb worked in the historic, site, so historic sites unit of, of Yukon government, government first as, a, as the registrar for historic sites and then as manager of historic sites, retiring in 2020. She was a member of a member of of ICOMOS Canada and 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 on the on the board for two two terms, including one term as vice president. But 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 Barb was part of the project team that developed the World Heritage Site nomination, but not nomination for Trondike Klondike. And Barb now spends her time cross country skiing, reading, boating, and gardening, which all sound wonderful. Um, we were hoping to be joined, but unfortunately won't be joined by Jackie Ol Olson from Tronda Quechin, First Nation. Um, 
and she, she, uh, 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 she, she, she's an artist um, who works mainly in textiles and beadwork and has produced a large amount of, amount of, 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 of regalia for her, her community as well as family. Um, um and and is a descendant of um of Joe uh, Joe and Annie Henry with within the Toronto Question First Nation. Um, she also has a background in finance and administration. Um, and worked as a as the director for the Toronto Question Heritage Department when 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 Toronto Question initially took on took on this project. Um, and and was a very uh, a very early supporter of the Toronto of the Toronto Klondike um, um um UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um. And she's now working as an independent artist. Um, and I, I believe um, Ali was going to talk a little bit more about J Jackie um, kind of later later on um, in our um, in our uh, discussion here as well. Um, and so um, we're going to kind of start with um, with, with some some questions that we've posed to the panel here. So the first um, 40 or 45 minutes will be questions posed to the panel. And then we're going to open things up to questions from questions from the, those of you who are, um, who, 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 who are viewing on, 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 online. We'll be monitoring um, kind of that, um, that, that, that end of, um, of, of, uh, of the forum as well here. Um, and so if you happen to have any questions, please do, do post, them in the, post them in the chat. Um, and so perhaps we'll start out with our first question here, and and so perhaps each of you could describe your 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 role in the project, and perhaps we'll um we'll start out with uh, with Rebecca, if you'd like to describe your role. Sure, I can do that. Uh, I'm grateful to be joining you today from the unceded Anishinaabe territory. Uh, I'm I'm in Ottawa, as Glenn mentioned. And um, I manager of international affairs for Parks Canada, and within that role, I've uh, Parks Canada has a role has a lead role um, in implementing the World Heritage Convention on behalf of the government of Canada. So there's a, a core team that works at Parks, helping uh, put forward nominations, but other World Heritage work as well, like reporting on existing sites and um, support and promotions uh, as well. So. Um, in that role, I've worked with nomination teams across the country on, well, I've been in the role for over 10 years now and just worked on eight nominations, including Tronda Klondike and had the pleasure of working with the team for about a decade from start to finish. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, how about yourself, Ali? Would you like to talk about your, um, your role on the, on the project? Sure, yeah. And um, just before um, I dive into that, um, I wanted to um, acknowledge that uh, um, recently Trondequichin elder, um, language speaker, knowledge keeper, storyteller, really amazing um, individual Percy Henry passed on. And, um, and uh, so it's a um, kind of a delicate time for, or a hard time for some folks in Trondequichin territory um, and throughout the Yukon. He was a a person who um, who had an impact uh, throughout the North, and uh, really his uh, he his words are 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 in the Trondequichin nomination. We would say his his snowshoe tracks are all over the nomination. So um, he's an important person to acknowledge before before I before I dive in to what I did. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so I uh, was involved in the in the um, Tronda Klondike nomination in a number of different ways. Uh, first, as an employee of the TH Heritage Department, uh, when I was a wee heritage baby back in 2012, 2013, um, I contributed to some preliminary conversations and then uh, joined the community advisory committee. Uh, then I had a little break in 2014 to have a baby. Uh, and I uh, ended up um, helping out as a contract researcher while I was on mat leaves. Um, I wrote uh, or helped write a section of the, the first iteration of the Trondike Klondike nomination and assisted with a few other sections. And then also as a contract researcher, I wrote a few papers that kind of contributed background knowledge on Trondequichin history, culture, and worldview. Uh, and then I returned to work full-time with TH Heritage in 2020. And uh, at that time, the World Heritage Project was kind of my main file, working very closely with Barb and Rebecca and lots of other folks who will 
will mention um, uh, to um, that have, you know, throughout that winter pull together uh, a revised um, uh, nomination and submit that um, to the World Heritage Center in mid-January 2021. So that was a wild ride. <laughs> um, and now I, I uh, help to coordinate uh, the Trondek Klondike World Heritage Site Stewardship Committee and um, did some work helping to celebrate the inscription and uh, will work, uh, continue to work um, in terms of sort of coordinating um, community um, community feedback and community consultation as we as we move forward now that the site has been inscribed. So it's always been a really a community driven project and um, it's, you know, that that continues to be the spirit of the site. So. Great, thank you so much, Ali. Um, mm -hmm. How about yourself, Barb? Hi. Um, okay, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, I'm sitting here within the traditional territories of the Ta'an Kwechan Council and the um, Kwanlun Dun First Nation near Whitehorse on Lake LaBarge. Um, so my role changed uh, over the years. Um, initially, I was providing support to my supervisor, Doug Alinek, and he was the Yukon government lead. And I was doing historical research, site research, attending some meetings and, and workshops uh, in Dawson. In 2013, funding was secured and uh, Trondek Witchin, I'll probably refer to them as TH kind of throughout, uh, just so you know, um, hired Paula Hazard as the first full-time project manager. Um, a Trondek Klondike World High Heritage Advisory Committee was created with members from Trondek Witchin, uh, community organizations, Parks Canada, City of Dawson and Yukon government, and also members from the community. I was the alternate member for that um, committee. A project management team was created and that was led by Paula and uh, Lee Wayland, the heritage officer from Trondek Witchin and myself from Yukon government, and later Molly Shore from Trondek Witchin um, were part of that project management team. So we worked really closely with Rebecca from Parks Canada and um, started working on the nomination. Um, we had a little blip, but in the fall of 2018, work continued and uh, Trondek Witchin was still the lead. And I worked with Lee Whalen on, on this part of the project. In 2019, the writing of the second nomination started. I was the principal writer, working with Ali Winton and Lee Whalen from Tronda Quitchen Heritage Department and Rebecca Kennedy from Parks Canada. Um, Yukon government provided myself as a staff person, uh, project archeologist Christian Tom Thomas and Rebecca Jansen to help with the nomination. It was really a collaborative work. Um, lots of conversations and discussions, exploring the best ways to present the values of the site um, while still meeting the UNESCO World Heritage requirements. And I, I can't um, emphasize what a pleasure some of those discussions were. I learned so much. Um, Trondo Gritchen also hired experts to do additional historic re historical research, Helen Doborowski and Joelle Ingram. And they also wrote chapter two and Lisa Prosper uh, provided a them thematic analysis and subsequently developed a comparative analysis and wrote chapter three. So I was resp responsible for writing um, all of the other chapters except chapter two and chapter three. And for these chapters, I was part of the review process along with Ali and Christian and provided comments and edits. Uh, my job was to ensure that all of the work flowed seamless, seamlessly from chapter to chapter and met the World Heritage Standards for the comparative analysis, authenticity, integrity, protection, and conservation. Um, after the nomination was submitted in 2021, I was hired by TH to provide support, help plan for the ICOMOS expert site visit, and assist in crafting subsequent responses to their questions and, and requests for further information. And I had retired at this point from Yukon government in 2020. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Barb. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody. Um, yeah, it's really great to kind of hear kind of everybody's role and kind of see how the pieces kind of come together there. Um, so the next question, that's a big question, I, I suppose. Um, so, 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 so why was the, what, 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 why was the Trondic, um, uh, Klondike nomination or, or nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site? And, and, and what, what's, what's special about the place and, and why did the nomination evolve over time? Um, so maybe we'll, uh, so start out with Ali, if you'd like. Okay. I think you're on mute right now, Ali. Yeah. Apologies, I've got a double mute system. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the Klondike um, in many different concepts or configurations had been on Canada's long and then short list for UNESCO World Heritage status for a very long time. And I think probably Barb knows that history a lot better than I do and could speak to that. Um, but uh, so there, there were probably many reasons that it was initially placed on that list, primarily to celebrate the Klondike Gold Rush at the time. Um, uh, and so I think for my perspective, I can kind of speak a little bit more to why it um, may have been inscribed, in my opinion. Um, obviously, uh, it's a phenomenal place. Um, gorgeous, intact ecosystems, thanks to generations of Trondikwichin stewardship. Uh, hundreds of amazing stories, incredible history, and a, a really resilient, thriving First Nation and a unique community that continues to kind of reinvent itself in, in the heart of that place. It's, that's kind of outstanding in itself. Um, but uh, so I believe the reason the site was successfully inscribed, however, is that the revised nomination, um, the revised concept um, that we presented helped to fill a gap in the UNESCO uh, roster, uh, the, the group of uh, World Heritage Sites. Uh, the nomination quite openly reckons with um, the horrible and ongoing stage in human history that is colonialism, and it does so from an Indigenous perspective, which was sort of unprecedented. So also the fact that this process was Indigenous-led is unique, and I think that really informed the uh, authentic nature of the nomination and, and the presentation of the site. Um, you know, that the Trondikwichin people survived the incredible impacts of the Klondike Gold Rush uh, and the ensuing colonial processes, and that Trondikwichin continue to kind of lead the way in terms of adaptation and ingenuity in this place is, is a story with parallels around the world. Um, what makes Trondike Klondike unique um, is that that experience, that colonial experience happened in a really... Um, in a really tight time frame, in um, you know, a period of of about thirty years, um, we can see all of the stages of of colonialism um, occurring uh, in Trondek Klondike, uh, as as exhibited by the the eight component sites that were selected to tell the story. So, um, yeah, I believe that that's why um, it was eventually inscribed um, because we we. Um, we're telling the story of a really phenomenal place from a unique perspective um, and kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit in terms of um, the, the, not necessarily the format, but um, the, the narrative um, of a World Heritage Site. Great. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, Barb, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Or? Yeah, I can give maybe a bit of background and Rebecca can probably um, add a little bit on the background too. Um, so the, the nomination evolved, well, the idea of a nomination evolved uh, over time. In 2004, uh, Klondike was listed on Canada's tentative list with the concept of a serial site connecting Seattle to Dawson commemorating the gold rushes that ultimately led to the Klondike gold rush. So it was quite a bit different than, than what we ended up with. The next iteration was focused solely on the Klondike area. So we had cut out the states because they weren't interested in, in uh, participating at this time. 
And the nomination was presented as a living, evolving cultural landscape that celebrated the enduring coexistence of the Trondekwichin and newcomers bound together by the Klondike Gold Rush. Uh, the landscape illustrated the relationship between the people and the land, both the ongoing indigenous presence and their connections, and gold mining that has continued since 1896 or since the Klondike Gold Rush. The nomination was withdrawn in 2018, as Ikemos indicated it wouldn't be successful. So uh, we kind of set back. And in the fall of 2018, Dr. Anita Smith was contracted by um, International Affairs Park, Parks Canada to do an assessment of the first nomination and conduct, conduct a site visit of Trondike Klondike. Dr. Smith is a World Heritage expert, and she provided a report outlining the strengths of the site and advice for different ways to move forward. So this was the basis for a new nomination, a serial site that showed the increasing effects of Euro-American colonization on an indigenous people, told from a Trondekwichian perspective. Um, we went further and um, sent in a concept to ICOMOS, and again, uh, Parks Canada, um, facilitated this and Nicomos reviewed the concept and thought that there was merit in it because as Ali said, it filled a gap. So um, I think that if we hadn't done that preliminary work, we wouldn't have had the basis to go forward with the second nomination. Um, we knew We knew that Dawson is a special place we knew that there was a story there that could be shared with the world. And when um, we looked at the site and we talked to Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith did a bunch of workshops. She met with the Klondike um, Advisory Committee, Trondike, which, Trondike Klondike Advisory Committee, and with Trondike Wichin and with community members and the project team. And um, we figured out that this is, this is really what had to happen. So why? Why is the um, the site a World Heritage Site? Um, it's the only site <laughs> that demonstrates um, the effects of colonialism, that demonstrates the experience and adaptation of an Indigenous peoples to this colonialism, and it expresses the continuity of the Indigenous peoples' culture before, during, and after the initial contact with the colonizers. And as Ali said, it was such a compressed time. You know, these changes were of a huge magnitude in, in like two generations, one generation. Um, so at, plus on top of that, the sites were all really well preserved. The, the physical elements that helped communicate that story are still intact and, and, um, and managed and conserved. Uh, there's a strong oral history from Trondekwichin. There's um, a strong culture there that uh, they were able to contribute <clears throat> and help relay that story through their eyes. <clears throat> so what's special about the place? Well, on a personal level, there's lots of things that are special about Dawson um, in terms of world heritage. The site has the most complete and exceptional archeological and historical evidence that reflects an indigenous people's experience of and adaptation to European colonialism. The site is a remarkable illustration of what indigenous, indigenous people around the world experienced over a 500 year period when European nations imposed their economic, political, military, social, and cultural power across the globe. So that's. Big thanks, Barb. Um, yeah, and so uh, over to you, Rebecca. If there's anything you'd like to add there as well, <laughs> it's always like this when you go last on a panel, right? <laughs> um, both Ali and Barb covered the bulk of it. I'll I'll just reiterate a few things, uh, from a slightly different viewpoint, I guess. Um, I think this one thing to remember about the World Heritage Convention is that sites have to show there has to be physical evidence. It is a a place based convention, and and one thing in Trondike Klondike that is so unusual is that, as we were saying, that that concentrated time frame for colonialism, but 
incredibly intact um, evidence and attributes of that in the landscape that, that you, you can read the story of the colonial experience, not just the Canadian, not just the Yukon, not just the Canadian colonial experience, but you know, a, a world's lived experience uh, in, in such a tight time frame in the landscape as you walk the landscape. And uh, so that was recognized in the inscription of the site and it most commented saying it was, I mean, took, I made notes for myself and I, and I reread a lot of things I haven't looked at in a couple of years, but uh, it most noted it was an exemplary case of a settlement pattern uh, showing the impacts of colonialism. And they appreciated that the lens was turned. Um, and, and as Ali had pointed out and Barb, it had been on Canada's uh, tentative list since 2004 with a focus on the gold rush. There was talk for a long time that it would be part of a sort of a trail approach with BC and going up through Alaska and and that just was never going to fly. So it sort of sat dormant for a long time before parks and and the Yukon Territory um, recommenced discussions. And Gordon Fulton, a, a retired Parks Canada expert on world heritage, was I think he was at a workshop in 2009, I wanted to say, I think, Barb. Um, where they sort of start to reinvigorate discussions about what could this look like if we're not talking about a trail? What is it in Dawson? And so we spent a lot of those early years, about 10, 10 years back, thinking about the map. What would, what would the boundaries of this place look like if it's trying to capture that story? And um, there was a, we did submit a first nomination that we worked on from 2013 in earnest in, into 2017 uh, that, that did look different and have a different lens than the second one that we've, and focused more on here but um that one was trying to that that first version was had encompassed the gold fields for instance um and uh most notably and a different take on the dawson townscape uh and was really focused more on the settler and and um and cultures coming together in the the interface and the the marriage of those two cultures and the tensions, but also the, the growth areas in that. Um, so changing our focus into putting fitting the gold rush into the longer timeline of an Indigenous people's history and their experience in the place meant that we had to change the map, had to physically look at the site differently. So I think I've said a lot of the same things that my, my friends here have already said, but it's just from a slightly tweaked, slightly different point of view. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's great. Thanks, everybody, um, for, for for kind of providing those those insights there. And I, I couldn't agree. A very very kind of agree more. A very special area, and it's great to kind of hear kind of um, kind of how the um, kind of how, how the whole process took shape, right? And kind of it's basically kind of the, that reorientation away from kind of the settler towards a more Quechan view of of the site, right? So thank you very much. Um, so our third question here. So I, 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 I know this project went on for for, 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 for for many years and a lot of people contributed to, to it. Um, can you talk about some of the other people who, who were instrumental in the project and, and, and the roles they played? Um, yeah, and so perhaps um, with this one, maybe we'll start out with, uh, with Barb here. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a lot of people involved. <laughs> um, many of them since 2006 when the first sort of ideas were floating around and how to how to go forward um the ones that stand out to me uh were the the champions that lived within the community um jackie olson uh she was involved when she was working within the administration of trying which in as ali said she was director of culture and heritage um she was amazing. She, she after she left um, Toronto Gwich'in and went on to other work, you know, she still remained an advocate within the within the community. Uh, she was providing ideas. She was um, providing guidance. She was providing her knowledge, and she really helped with um, a vision of what the potential for this site could be. Uh, Debbie Nagano also. Um, as director of culture and heritage at Trondick Wichin, you know, she provided guidance, um, support for the project. She ensured the leadership, senior leadership, um, continued to support the project. Uh, Wayne Potteroka, he was director of communications for Trondick Wichin, 
and also mayor of Dawson City. Um, he put in a lot of a lot of time, effort, and support. Um, and he was also um, the print editor of the second nomination. Um, who else? Mark Wickham was also uh, in Dawson at the time, and he was uh, providing some project management, acquiring and reporting on um, funding by economic developments, development grants. Rick Lemaire was director of cultural services with Yukon government. Um, he provided guidance and support for the project until he retired in 2020, um, championing it to the senior leadership, particularly through some really difficult times. He, he was um, fairly crucial um, there. Paula Hazard, Molly Shore, Lee Whalen, Ellie Winton, um, were all Trondequitchen staff who worked many, 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 many hours um, on the nomination through thick and thick and thin, and I'm sure left parts themselves um, in the pages. Christian Thomas was an archaeologist from Yukon government, and he provided his expertise and knowledge during site tours and the writings of chapters two and three. Also created uh, the maps for the nomination and worked many, many, many hours. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca Kennedy from uh, World Heritage and International Affairs at Parks worked many hours and provided insight into the world of World Heritage, um, along with information, expert advice, and kept us on track for timelines, along with a little bit of humor, and uh, ensured that the nomination met the World Heritage requirements. And I'm like, I'm sure there are more, but those kind of just came to mind for me. Great, thank you so much, Barb. Um, how about yourself, Rebecca? Is there anybody anybody else there? I mean, there's yeah, Barb. Barb said many people, and and she mentioned me, so I have to mention her. She's been a real <laughs> mainstay for this project. <laughs> um, and and you know, I'm I'm a step removed, based in Ottawa, so I know there were elders and community, like business community members, for instance, that helped out. Um, and sort of heroes that that we wouldn't see from from where I sit. The the advisory board was had a dedicated advisory board and very committed advisory board members, steering committee members over a number of years. It was and it was really evident. Um, and the all the project team leads were very impressive. Molly and Paula and Lee, um, really really impressive colleagues to work with. And and like I said, I've worked with the teams across the country on a number of these projects. They're all different. They're they're all a different scenario. They're all putting forward a different case. But it has put me in a unique position to think about, oh, this worked for this team and this worked more for this team. And I was always impressed with the TK team. Um, I would echo Barb in saying that uh, Rick Lemaire and Doug Olenek with the territory really, really got the ball rolling and, and did a lot of work um, around 2010 to, to 2015 to really make sure this project was grounded, that it was led in the community. Um, and I don't know if we would be where we are without that. So I, I, you know, I think a special thanks needs to go out to them. And former Parks Canada experts, um, Gordon Fulton, I mentioned, quietly helping behind the scenes even after retirement. And my World Heritage mentor, John Pinkerton was amazing. Uh, both when he was in his role, doing the job I do now, but um, also he he helped us redevelop the nomination too, and and was fantastic. He was he would go down in memory as my last lunch date before the pandemic was John and I sitting across my office, and nobody else was having lunch in this little cafe by this point, and it was you know early March 2020, and but we were like we got to meet on TK, and we got to sit there, and we were just sort of ignoring the fact that we weren't supposed to be meeting really. Um, because we just had to meet in person and go over some things um, on the project as as we were in the middle of pushing things forward. So all of those people, Diane Wilson, who's and and Travis Travis Weber, who are both with Parks Canada. Diane's the former Yukon um, field unit superintendent, and she really had a a watch over the project. Um, the the role of the field unit is as a, a partner in the site versus mine, which is a an expert-based role in Ottawa, and and Diane really kept things in line and championed it within Parks Canada. The senior management made sure people stayed informed um, and had the support that it needed um, within the federal government beyond Parks Canada too, actually, and 
and she was so delighted and she phoned me like nearly in tears when we got the news and it was just so it was, it was a special moment um and i would echo barb in mentioning dr anita smith uh, an australian expert who kindly um came to canada for the first time came to the north for the first time she normally works in southern climes and and we had a workshop with her um i want to say 2018 a bit fuzzy on the dates but uh she was wonderful top quality advisor and and even after that period that we had contracted it for uh she's she's still helped out and still remains interested in the project so that's that's my top 10 or 20 list and i know ali's got even more great thank you so much rebecca and yeah maybe we'll uh, move on to ali and she can provide more thank you <laughs> yeah um of course there's so many people um and barb and and rebecca kindly mentioned a lot of the people who were really really hands-on um, so I'll mention all of the Trondikwichan elders who uh, have really guided us and Trondikwichan in a, a cultural revival, like a, a renaissance that part of this nomination is, is kind of re representative of that. Um, so these are elders who uh, held on to knowledge and language despite uh, brutal, multi-generational attempts to erase that knowledge, that worldview. Uh, and it's their recollections, their words that speak through the nomination and that I believe helped guide it to its successful stage. So uh, many of the el elders who were involved directly or indirectly um, over the decades of kind of sharing knowledge, many of them have passed on. And so um, when the nomination was successfully, when the site was successfully inscribed, we kept saying at the Heritage Office that um, uh, this is kind of in honor of those elders. Um, the This inscription and the site uh, into the future is honoring all those folks who shared knowledge that kind of all contributed to um, our ability to to tell this story in the, in the way that we did. So just some of those names of, of elders are Percy Henry, of course, uh, Julia Moorberg, Ronald Johnson, um, also known as the mayor of Moosehide, uh, Edward Roberts, amazing um, language keeper, storyteller. Um, Angie Joseph Rear is still with us and still working so hard to share Han um, language. Uh, for those who don't know, Han is the, the language of the Trondikwichin. Um, Georgette McLeod, another heritage warrior who was my first mentor in the heritage department, and she herself was mentored by David Neufeld. Um, so Georgette continues to work tires tirelessly for the Han language and um, is an amazing role model and um, provided a lot of language assistance um, for the nomination. You'll notice there's a big, or for anyone who's glanced at the nomination, there's a multiple page glossary and uh, that's um, represents a lot of the work of Georgette and, and Percy Henry. Uh, Jody Beaumont, um, also a heritage hero, a mentor, a inspiration, uh, such work ethic and a person who really um, uh, has really formulated or has established really beautiful relationships with TH community members and knowledge holders, which has led to the documentation and, and revitalization of so much knowledge. So a lot of the, the kind of background information that informed the nomination was developed by folks like Jody Beaumont, Georgette McLeod, Sue Parsons, um, amazing heritage stalwart, always with kind of a, both a micro and macro view of things and a great perspective. Uh, Paula Hazard, uh, who Barb mentioned, Molly Shore, Helen Dobrolowski, um, did so much, so much writing and rewriting, <laughs> so many revisions. Um, and uh, she's done a lot of research for Trondikwichin. So a lot of her work also kind of formed some of the, the backbone and, and a lot of the references um, that we used in the, in the nomination. Um, Lee Whalen, Debbie Nagano, um, current heritage director who um, is sort of the current figurehead for the stewardship committee and that, you know, um, really carries a heavy weight being a, a representative of a project like this in, in a community. Um, of course, David Neufeld himself, um, uh, he had a, a really beautiful relationship with Trondikwichin and um, 
contributed a lot of time and and work um, and mentorship and and just all around support that helped Toronto Kuchin, in particular the Toronto Kuchin Heritage Department, kind of arrive at a place where we were able to take on a project like this. Um, yeah, and then I think most of the other folks have been mentioned. Oh, Dan Sokolowski, actually a, a filmmaker in Dawson City who <laughs> responded to many last minute, like really last minute, like the day before <laughs> requests <laughs> for um, uh, filming and uh, filming um, speeches that uh, the Toronto Kuchin representatives um, were then offered at the um, World Heritage um, committee meeting where Toronto Klondike was inscribed. Uh, he also um, did very fast work on the layout and design of the final nomination that we submitted. Um, and uh, former Toronto Kitchen Chief Roberta Joseph was a champion of the project. Current and former Toronto Kitchen Chief and Council members um, all um, have supported this project throughout the years um, during a time when you know, um, Toronto Quijin had a lot of other really important pro um, priorities. And um, sometimes it was a little bit of a battle to keep this project going and to keep it on 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 the list of, of many important things that, that had to be done. But um, yeah, um, somehow with all this amazing community support and support through levels of government and um, grassroots kind of on the ground support, um, yeah, it came together. Great, thank you so much, Ali. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, and it just kind of highlights just how many people were involved and kind of how how big um, this this project was. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, and so, what were what what was one of, one of your more challenging moments on the project, and how did you overcome this this moment here? Um, and so maybe we'll uh, we'll go to Rebecca here for for this one. Sure. Uh... I was thinking about this since you sent the, the questions and mulling over what to bring up and um you know there's there's lots of challenges of course with any project and, and projects that span a long period of time in particular uh, i say in the early days we had challenges wrestling it to the ground the, the concepts um i recall there was at one point when the team was aiming at a certain year to submit the project and, and it was clear to John and I that they weren't ready yet. So we had to deliver that tough news. These things are submitted on an annual deadline. So we just knew it was going to take another year or two. So there are definitely some project management moments like that. Um, after we had decided to withdraw the nomination, um, knowing that it, it wasn't going to get a favorable response from the committee um, based on Nicomo's feedback, of course, we had to think about what to do next, and nobody was expecting to have to work on something for another two or three years. Uh, we we had hoped it would be a World Heritage Site at that point. So, and I say we in a collective, the the project partners um, that Barb and Ali represented, but also Parks Canada is the state party for World Heritage, and and I I personally could see a path. Like there was there was definitely interest in the international community on. They, their interest was piqued on pieces of this, but it needed to be glued together in a different way. Uh, and they really, we had had a couple of big heavyweight um, newly inscribed nominations already in, from Canada, uh, notably the match and key not long before that. So there, there were eyes on Canada and how we were treating Indigenous heritage and the world heritage system at that point. Um, and so I, I felt some days like I was sort of the, the person with the bellows, fanning the flames a little, both within our own management, but also with the project partners. But I'm, I was in an advisory role. I'm not a decision maker, right? So, uh, and there, there were lots of pros and cons to continuing or not. Um, like Ali said, there were, there were other competing priorities. There's funding questions um, and project fatigue. So that's, that was sort of a, a holding my breath moment like I really believe in this and I hope we keep going with this um and then and then knowing the eyes were on us like <laughs> okay guys the funders eyes and and management and governments within Canada but also this the ICOMOS internationals um attention was on the project and 
and just you know hopes that we could carry it through. And then the the other thing I'll mention is those final stages were in in the beginning of the pandemic, or well, not even just the beginning, them through <laughs> through the course of the whole pandemic actually. And so we were at a stage towards the end there. This, with all these nominations, there's you finally submit a project you've been working on for a number of years, and then you still have an evaluation phase, which can be exhausting as well. There's a there's back and forth with the advisors to the World Heritage Committee, uh, and it's it's pretty heavy some days. Um, a whole lot of work, a lot of written work back and forth, and and that got really exhausting. That coupled with the pandemic and responding to some pretty tough questions from Ikemos, wondering about the boundaries and protection of the site, um, and and working as a group on that um, had some tough days. But like I said, it was a fantastic project team, and and they they kept things pushing forward. So. Yeah, we made it through that. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, how about yourself, Ali? Yeah, gosh, um, there were challenging moments. Um, uh, I feel like I had some interesting experiences when I, I was working as a contractor in various pre and postpartum states of exhaustion. <laughs> Um, and in various locales, uh, one of them being Cheddar Deck, uh, the 40 mile river, which is um, 40 mile site is a component part in the in the site. Um, and I remember at one point we were trying to, to merge work with a kind of bush vacation. And so I was working on a paper while uh, living at an old fa family cabin in the bush. And so in order to get some writing done, we had to pull out the generator, fire it up, charge up the, the computer. I worked while standing at my my father's old uh, work table, like a carpentry desk, a carpentry table. Um, and then uh, we'd bundle up the baby um, and skidoo upriver a couple of miles to our closest neighbors who had satellite internet. <laughs> and then I would email my drafts into Barb and Molly and Paula. And uh, they were so patient with me. <laughs> I'm sure that I missed every deadline <laughs> as a contractor. Um, but uh, their their attention to detail was always appreciated. <laughs> and their patience was appreciated. Um, and uh, it was cool to be in, like, in situ, right? In place, like, looking out uh, out the window, writing about about the place that uh, eventually became a part of this this nomination. Um, so that was kind of an adventure. Uh, I think perhaps the most challenging times were um, the winter months of 2020, uh, when the world was in the depths of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Trondike Klondike team, we were really down to the wire. <laughs> um, uh, we were doing lots of last minute editing and revising and Chris Thomas was pulling together all the maps and images for the revised nomination. And um, uh, I recall one uh, very late night editing session on Christmas Eve. <laughs> I, I had to get my edits in and put myself to bed before Santa came. Um, and so there are lots of overtime, lots of personal sacrifices um, on behalf of everybody, uh, probably some tears shed. And, uh, but it, it was kind of, I, at the time, I, I, I reckon the, the project is sort of like writing a dissertation as a group project. <laughs> um, and the, the, um, the group of writers or experts was like 10, 15, 20 people. And you were writing it on behalf of your community and submitting it to an international audience of experts. So um, there was some stress, there was some weight there for sure. Um, and for myself, the way I kind of dealt with that was I was very lucky at the time to be working in the old Trondequichin Heritage Office, which is on the top floor of the TH administration building. It has this beautiful view of the Yukon River. And so when I felt that weight, when I felt a little bit of panic hit, I um, was very privileged to have this beautiful view and would just look out at the frozen river in all, all of its states of uh, sort of twilight beauty and get a little bit of grounding, get focused on the work and just kind of pull it together and um, do the work because you were just one 
one member in a team, right? And uh, and there were people depending on you. And I would say that um, from what I've learned um, as a nodelet, as a settler living in Dawson City and working with Toronto Kitchen, that uh, that's actually a pretty central Toronto Kitchen value. That idea of you're never just an individual, right? You're a member of a family, of a community. For TH folks, you're a member of a clan, a language group. And so you represent others, and that's how it felt working on this project. You know, it was a it was a community driven project um, from the beginning, and you were um, working on it on on behalf of um, your whole community. And so it, um, yeah, it was always kind of an honor, even though it was sometimes felt felt a bit heavy and challenging. Great, thank you so much for sh for sharing those experiences, Ali. Um... Yeah, and so maybe we'll move over to, to Barb here. Yeah, there were there were a few challenging moments. <laughs> I think part of it um, that was difficult was to to try and fit something into a different format. Um, for an international audience uh, that didn't necessarily, you know, English wasn't their first language. Um, and how do you, how do you keep the authenticity and truth to a story when you sort of have to, to deal with those parameters? And I know at times we sort of pushed back and, and Rebecca would say, yeah, no, that's not going to work guys. <laughs> You've got to think about this like this. And, and, uh, and at times it felt almost like we were, I don't know if it's called managing the information or managing the story to, to fit this one format. But I think, I think again, through those discussions and through, um, you know, input from Ali and from Christian and Lee that we were able to, to keep going ahead and keeping the, keeping the authenticity to, to the place. Um, but a really challenging memory for me was, was when we, um, when the nomination was withdrawn in 2018, I mean, that was just gut wrenching. That was, that was all of this work and all of this time and, and all of these hopes were just kind of like, nope, it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, we had lots of meetings over the summer at the operational level. We had, you know, discussions between, with parks and with, uh, trying to pitch in and and just trying to figure out, you know, do we have the energy? Like, do we even want to do this? Does the community want to do this? You know, does trying to pitch in want to do this? Or are we just, if we had enough, you know, have we invested enough into this project and just sort of let it go? Um, but I don't think anybody really wanted to do that. Um, I had lots of meetings and briefings with my superiors in government, you know, giving them an analysis of, of what happened with that nomination and, and what would the next steps be and how much it's going to cost and, you know, what's the risk, you know, what's the risk to the department and what's the risk to the politicians, you know, because this is an investment using public money or, you know, staff that works for, for um, a government. So there were concerns that, you know, they didn't want to uh, just kind of throw away more time and effort. So, you know, Parks Canada came to the rescue. We, we talked about it and talked about it. And, and um, they hired Anita Smith, Dr. Smith. And that gave us um, a really objective third party view of, yes, you have something here. Yes, this is a really strong, you know, there's there's a, lots of strong emotions about the site. There's lots of things that um, resonate, that will resonate with a lot of people. And so she gave us sort of a, the idea of how to go forward. And, um, and I think that's, that was the turning point. And it was kind of like, okay, well, everybody gear up again because here we go. <laughs> Only this time we have a shorter time frame. We can use a lot of the, the work that was done earlier, but, you know, pedal to the metal, off we go. And so um, after uh, Dr. Smith submitted a report, uh, we did 
a concept proposal for ICOMOS. They reviewed it. And a few months later, we started writing the second nomination. So it was worth it. Great, thank you so much, Barb. Yeah, um, so maybe we'll move on to our next question here. Um, and so, what was what, 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 what was one of the most mem mem what, what one of the most memorable moments of, of the project here? Um, and perhaps, uh, yeah, this time we'll start with with uh, Ali here. So, yeah, lots of memorable moments. Um, uh, I mean, the 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 project, uh, you know, took place over a decade. Um, so, uh, so much, so much happened during that time. Uh, for me, my kids kind of came into being while this project progressed. So I tend to use their births and ages to timestamp various stages in the work. Like, okay, I was working as a contractor then. And, um, so there's, uh, that kind of personal significance. Um, uh, and, uh, one particular memory actually um, was in the spring of 2020, uh, the early stages of the pandemic, um, TH offices had shut down. Um, I was sort of in limbo, I was transitioning from one position to another. And we're all sort of diligently working from home, um, but I didn't really know what I should be working on or if I actually still had a job. I was signing in every day, but not, not certain. And then I got an email from Barb Hogan and Christian Thomas saying that uh, they'd heard I was now the TH contact for the World Heritage Project. So uh, that essentially told me, okay, I do have a job. And <laughs> it gave me a purpose during that pretty awkward and scary time. That was such a such a such an interesting time so it was it was kind of nice to put your head down and focus on um something very in-depth something that really you know it took a lot of brain power to as barb said kind of reconfigure um this nomination but it was exciting for me um i i was immediately excited about this new approach um i recall reading through uh the reports from anita smith and the new kind of concept. And my first thought was, okay, this uh, new iteration of the nomination just has to be written in the TH voice. Uh, it has to come from Twandekwishin. We have to have lots of Han language. And of course, the nomination isn't necessarily written all in the Toronto Kitchen voice, um, but the foreword is. And um, uh, I think that really helps to ground the reader. Um, and um, for anyone who's who's listening, the nomination is on the Trondike Klondike website, which needs to be updated, but the nomination is available there. And, and I would recommend it. It's just the culmination of so much work. It's a weighty document. It's over 300 pages of mostly Barb's writing, <laughs> really amazing detailed writing. Um, but just the forward and the executive summary provide so much information. It really brings together, brought together a lot of great minds and um, a lot of the, the disparate information that had kind of been, um, been written about trying to quit in and, and, and about the place and the history over many, many years kind of came together in that nomination. Um, yeah, and I think that was one of the reasons it that the project continued and why it was it was always viewed as beneficial for Toronto Quichin and for the community of Dawson, whether the the site ended up being inscribed or not. This was a chance to do all of this research that we had wanted to do and to bring the community together in a celebratory way. Um, all these different groups of people, um, bringing them together and then asking them, what is special about this place? Why, why do you live here? Why do you love it? Um, if you had the chance to tell the story of this place to, to the outside world, what, what would you share? And so it was a cool sort of reflective experience for the community. Um, there were also lots of great times um, doing field work with elders. That's always really fun, being out on the river with Auntie Joseph Rear or stomping through the bush with Chris Thomas and Barb and, and Helen Dobrolowski. Um, and then, of course, the the World Heritage Meeting when Trondic Klondike was officially inscribed. Um, that meeting took place in Saudi Arabia in the fall of 2023. Um, and there wasn't a delegation from the Yukon um, that attended. So we all watched it online from our various locales. And because of the time difference, I think it was about 4 a.m. in the Yukon. I was actually in a campground outside of Toronto with my family, <laughs> which uh, was a very strange place to be um, watching it. So I, I sort of snuck out of the tent and and um, 
watched the the inscription happen live through on a little phone screen and did a little jig and had a celebratory campfire coffee. <laughs> um, and so even though I was very far away from home and and not physically um, with any of the folks who I knew were watching, it still was a moment of feeling connected um, and and very proud of uh, all all the work that had gone in over the years and uh, all the different people who who contributed. So yeah, a few memories from me. Great, thank you so much, Ali. Um, how about yourself, Barb? Uh, what's uh, what are some kind of memorable moments in terms of the the, the project? Mm -hmm. There are lots, yeah. Over the years, there are lots. I think um, the times when we were touring people through the site. So you know, Rebecca would come in from Ottawa, and her uh, director came in from Ottawa. I don't remember if there was somebody else or not. Anyway, we would take them through the site or we would take um, consultants through the site. We had experts uh, come in and do an evaluation. And so they would tour the site. And there was a certain, I don't know, just pride in the area, sharing this beautiful place with these people when they're seeing it for the first time, um, sitting in a riverboat, you know, going down river and looking at these beautiful, beautiful hills and, and you're able to share it with these people who who haven't experienced this particular spot. Um, those are those were great moments. Yeah, tromping through the bush, you know, with Allie and Christian and Helen, you know, climbing a hundred foot gravel cliff. You know? <laughs> Two senior citizens at the top going, "Why are we doing this?" <laughs> um, but I think the most memorable for me, as Ali said, was uh, watching um the world heritage committee meeting in in saudi arabia and hearing congratulations to canada on the inscription of trondic Klondike to the world heritage list and that was that kind of brought the whole import of that nomination and that this was this was canada you know we presented or developed something that canada put forward and it was recognized as internationally significant so that's pretty awesome yeah even at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> a few things to get you up at four in the morning but that's one of them <laughs> 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 so that's great thank you so much barb yeah um and how about yourself rebecca memorable moments oh you know just ditto like <laughs> um before I took on the job working on World Heritage, I had been to Dawson once and had the time of my life. And Barb's laughing because she, she witnessed that. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking, I'll never get to come back here. I can't, you know, we can't, it's a long way to go. I can't afford it, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I'll get to go to work for some time. And, and then I got to, you know, step off the plane in the Dawson International Airport for 10 years, a few more, every, you know, every second year or so, which was fantastic. Uh, and it is a stunning, beautiful part of the world. I'm from Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. I'm from the East Coast, so don't know the Yukon at all, or I didn't until then. And now, now I feel I do. And now I, for the record, recommend it to anybody I come across who wants to travel in Canada and wants to experience somewhere very special. So yeah, getting to go to the Yukon was a memorable and special experience many times um and of those trips the much as i said my my lunch date with john was my last lunch before the pandemic and uh the pandemic and and Trondic klondike are always going to be mixed up in my head because my first air travel um post post-ish pandemic if you will was uh for the evaluation mission in september 2021 and we had just gymnastics of logistics to get uh, an American expert to come up and he was assigned to do the evaluation. Um, the local team was wizards yet again. And, uh, you know, I got on an airplane, which had been normal for so long and then wasn't, um, and got off at Dawson International Airport. <laughs> and, and you know, by this time, like I had known Lee and Barb and, and Ali and Debbie and others for years. So I got to see friends I hadn't seen and didn't know when I would get to see them again. So that was super special. And we got to have drinks at Bombay Peggy's and we had to, we were there to work, but it was just, 
at that point, I think I, nobody was taking for granted getting to see people, right? So that was a very special trip. Um, and about the inscription, I had the lucky assignment of being the person who opened the email from the ambassador to UNESCO, Canada's ambassador to UNESCO, got the official email, but I was in copy on that. And I was um, sitting at home because it was the pandemic and got up and squealed and ran around. <laughs> and uh, and I had always said to Lee Whalen, like, I'm just going to phone you when the time comes and you're not going to know. And so I got to phone him and, and asked if Debbie was nearby because I was hoping to catch two of them together. And and uh, he was like, no, <laughs> but I was, you know, able to convey this good news. And, and I remember that I, quite against protocol, I was so excited because I, we really didn't know if, if it was going to be inscribed. It wasn't, still wasn't a slam dunk right up to that last minute. And I remember I, I wrote back, kind of knee-jerk reaction, wrote back Canada's ambassador to UNESCO in capital letters. And I think I put, oh my God, really? And press send, you know, copy to my boss and all these other people and after the thought, after that thought, probably wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the best, but, but that was how I felt was capital letters. And, uh, and, and it was amazing to be in Riyadh, to be at the World Heritage Meeting and, and see on a very big screen to see pictures of Canadian places and to know you guys were up at four in the morning, glancing down at my iPad and seeing the notes from everybody. And I remember Ali put tears in my eyes. It just, it just made my heart melt to know that she was she sent me this little, you know, the little note sort of, I'm just having a cup of coffee, snuck out of the tent. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, and, and sharing that with my internationally faced colleagues, because at those annual meetings, I get to see the people who do the same work as me every year and to have them come up and, and say congratulations. And a number of them had read it and, and said, you know, it's a good quality piece of work and well done. So it was really special to have the mix of those two worlds at that meeting. That's great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so maybe we'll, um, we had kind of one more kind of pose question, but uh, maybe we'll move to our, um, to, to kind of um, the, the, the questions that we have, um, that, that, that we've received um, on, on, on YouTube here. Um, and this, this one actually really kind of dovetails with the one that we were going to pose any anyways but greg marquis um has asked them to 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 to, to, to any of the presenters um do 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 you think that the world heritage nomination will inspire others um and so maybe i'll leave that for whoever whoever wants to an answer this question um and we'll we'll make it a, a free for all here <laughs> for whoever would like to well i i can tell you it already has um and I, I say that because we get some of the incoming mail on that uh, at our office, and we are working on on other Indigenous-led projects. and And one thing our office always does is is um, ask project leaders to turn to previous project teams uh, to learn about their lived experience developing nominations, not just logistics, but the growth in it and how to present a place and and this Tronda Klondike, along with a few other projects, but has really helped Canada solidify its role uh, as a leader in Indigenous world heritage, which is which is a fantastic thing. So the world is watching, uh, not just the nomination, but how we manage and present that heritage. Because of course, the nomination, it's a, it was a hell of a lot of work, but it got us to the world heritage site, which is from here on in. So definitely there are others others watching and lots of interest. Um, and in the academic world, we get we get interest from that quarter as well, not just those who work on nominations. Great, thank you so, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and uh, is there anybody else who wants to um, answer that question? Or um, I believe there's another question in the, in the and on the chat on YouTube, if um, people would like, and we can move move, move to that if if uh, if people like. Uh, so. Oh, um, Ali, you wanted to say something there? Something? Yeah, I just want to say quickly that um, I think certainly, as Rebecca says, yeah, it um, will probably inspire um, other folks um, globally and um, and outside of the Yukon, but also I think just in terms of um, a local perspective, uh, it's 
it's uh, a huge point of pride now for Trondequichin and I, especially for young Trondequichin citizens. Um, sometimes, you know, growing up in a small, isolated northern town, um, you don't you don't know uh, that it's why your your place is special and um, why your your hometown might be so special. And um, so to have this sort of official stamp, this kind of feather in the cap, um, it's uh, not that, you know, it was it, it's not necessary to have that sort of uh, outside kind of stamp of approval. But um, I do hope that it that it inspires um, uh, young folks in in Dawson and in the Yukon and particularly Indigenous people to be like, oh, this place is special because of our story and because the way we opened up and and were able to tell it. Um, and not just because of the gold rush and and that sort of uh, event that um, that brought a lot of settlers to the area. So, um, yeah, I hope that it's inspiring in that way as well. And that's kind of up to the community in terms of how we interpret and 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 share the site. So, yeah. Great, thank you much, so much, Ali. Um, but was there anything you wanted to say about that, Barb? Or uh... um, not, not particularly. I mean, I hope that. It is inspiring for other um, places that are on Canada's tentative list or actually any, on any of the tentative lists um, to see that um, the voice of the community or an Indigenous community is really important in telling a story about a place and that the place is always connected to the people. And so... Um, yeah, I just I hope that continues on as a thread where the people in the place are are equally important. Great, thank you so much, Barb. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll move on. So there's another question um, on uh, on YouTube here. Uh, so Aaron Spinney at, um, states, I'm uh, uh, I'm familiar with the rejection from things I've submitted. But but I don't think I've I, 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 I don't think we deal well with, with, with feelings about, about about withdrawing submissions before before rejection. Can the panel speak about 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 processing emotions um, surrounding withdrawing the application in in, in twenty eighteen? So that's a good question. Yeah. Um. So if I don't know who uh, wants to wants to feel feel this one. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, gut wrenching was, you know, one of the words. <laughs> um, at first, I think there was uh, disbelief or anger. Oh, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And then, and then, sort of processing and thinking, okay, well, you know, we've missed the mark. Either how we communicate, what we communicated, or how we communicated, and how can we fix that? Because the place is, um, is pretty special. So, I guess you just power through it and keep moving. For me, yeah, I I would add Barb's rights and everything she just said, and it it's moments like that. It's tough to separate professional and personal as well. Like we were all personally invested in this. Um, and you sort of want to lay blame and it's not a blame thing. Um, the system had shifted. There was, there were just too many questions for ICOMOS to comfortably say that they could go ahead and recommend this. And, and there were shifting sands and policies in, in the system, which we don't have time to get into here, but, uh, and, and I, I felt, and I'm, I know my Parks Canada colleagues uh, who put a lot of time in this felt that could we have done something different? What could we have done different? And, you know, we tried to do all the checks and balances all along. And um, and we were right to withdraw at that point and, and start again. And we actually had inter inter ICMOS International support in doing that, you know? So it's, I think the project, the concept of what in 2004 got put on the tentative list grew with thinking in heritage over time. Uh, so it made for an awfully long, that's 20 years ago, <laughs> 2004, 20 uh, tentative list. Um, so we had to grow along with it. And sometimes there were collisions in that growth and we were sort of sideswiped a little bit. 
it was hard. It was tough. It was very tough to process. That's a very astute question, and it took a long time. But we believed in the project, as Barb just said, and I think we also had to believe in the system that we have to work within this system. But we believe in what we're going to put forward. So let's pay attention to the messages we're getting in that hesitancy and and work with it. And I, I think that's what we did. I'm proud of what we we did in turning that around and and persevering. Like that's. That was a, a very proud but tough moment. Thanks. Uh, 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 is there anything you wanted to add, Ali, to, 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 to that question? Or? Yeah, well, I guess I was a little bit um, lucky that I was on a maternity leave at that time. So, and I, I wasn't as uh, deeply involved in the writing of the first nomination. So, um, yeah, I didn't have to be on the receiving end of that sort of email that just like would have hurt so much because there was so much work, um, so much very good detailed um, um, work that went into that um, first iteration of the nomination. Um, it was really ins inspirational to kind of watch as a contractor or as on the on the sidelines to watch it come together. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I do recall when I when I heard the news um, and then coming back into the project in 2020, um, I, um, it, it kind of made sense to me. The, the feedback um, made sense, you know? Um, uh, the, uh, as Rebecca and Barb said, there, there had been a lot of change over um, the years in the initial um, uh, sort of concept of, uh, of the nomination. And um, you know our our understanding of um, of the place will continue to change. So that's going to be we're going to have to keep dealing with with um, not necessarily like a big international feeling of rejection, but we're going to have to keep dealing with criticism <laughs> and and working with it. And so it is kind of a, a lesson in um, accepting criticism um, gently, being gentle with yourself, but realizing that there's a, a grain of truth there. I think that um, the way the nomination morphed and evolved, um, I didn't get into this earlier, actually, how the nomination evolved over time, but um, I think that the way it, it did evolve, um, it was really beautiful. And and what we came to in the end, we, you know, we, we, we moved from trying to tell a very broad story with a, a very large site that at times did seem a little bit unwieldy. Um, um, and we um, uh, ended up telling a more concentrated story um, uh, with a serial site with a theme that really resonates and speaks to a lot of the learning and unlearning that uh, global societies are experiencing right now. So I think essentially we kind of put a finer point on it. And it wouldn't have happened without that very devastating rejection. Um, but yeah, I think that by receiving that rejection, by regrouping, um, we were able to tell the story from the TH perspective as much as possible. And by focusing on their experiences, in effect, the nomination kind of, it like focuses the lens and also lengthens the, the view or the timeline. Um, and um, makes it an ongoing story. Um, uh, without a beginning and an end. Um, and I think that that sort of, that voice was always kind of vibrating kind of in the background um, for us. And uh, it took that sort of experience for it to come up and and um, and to be able to say, hey, you know, the, this, the history of this place didn't start uh, with the gold rush and we don't necessarily need to use that as our, as our timestamp. In fact, that that event was just a blip on um, the Trondekwichin timeline, which extends far, far into the past, into time immemorial, as we say, and is continuing into the future. So, yeah, um, I do feel for the people though who who receive those emails and and after so much hard work um, had to regroup. Uh, I know it was really challenging, um, but yeah, I think the the end result was um, was a good one. So. Great, thank you so much, Ali. Um, and yeah, I think that's those are kind of wonderful thoughts to kind of wrap up on as well as basically kind of that that longer, you know, that time timeline there um, thoughts. Um, so um, 
thank you everybody for for joining us today um and thank you for all of the work i mean just listening to this it, I, I i never realized just how much um work kind of went into um, a unesco world heritage site so thank you very much for um providing these wonderful insights and i know it was um a lot of work for all of you but it was definitely um w worthwhile work and what you've accomplished is remarkable and as far as i'm concerned you should all um be awarded phds um, right right now here um but yeah thank you very much for, for joining us and unfortunately it's virtual so you can but i'm sure people are clapping at their computers at home um this was really wonderful and very educational um yeah so um and thank you everybody for joining us on online as well so yeah thank you Thanks so much, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. And we'll talk later. Sounds, yeah, sounds yeah. wonderful. It was, <laughs> yeah, it, it was thanks, fun. Glenn. It was fun to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. 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 And thank you, Heather, for doing all the behind the scenes tech. Yeah.